It's Gabe. Wait, wait. Where'd the music go? Oh. There isn't intro music? All right. I guess we'll just sit in silence for, um, three, two, one. Hi, it's Gabe, the Oscope Wizard, Perota and Schwartz. Today, I'd like to tell you a story. A story about thieves, heroes, perseverance, and most importantly, connection. Go pro for what? Now, normally I talk about oscilloscopes. They're usually the Batman in my story. I'm Batman. Solving all the problems and returning home the hero. I'm Batman. But today, we are going to focus on the Robin in the room. The humble oscilloscope probe. Hold on. Wait a cotton pick a minute here. Humble? How do you think this scope sees anything? It'd be blind without me. Ah, that is the truth. Without oscilloscope probes, oscilloscopes would have a lot of trouble connecting to circuits. And they really wouldn't be very useful. Oh, and by the way, when you hear this tone, please turn the page. What? We didn't send out storybooks? What kind of place is this? Oh, we're making a video so they can just follow along at home? Cool, cool, cool. Great! On with the story! The first probe in our little story is Passive Call. Say hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Now, Paul is a totally passive probe, meaning he works without any power. Paul, like most of his counterparts, works as a 10 to 1 voltage divider. Nine mega ohms come from Paul, and one mega ohm are supplied by the scope. Seems like I'm doing most of the heavy lifting. A passive probe is generally included with nearly every scope in the world, so Paul and his cohorts are all over the place. Hey, is that enough caveats? We can see from Paul's data sheet that he's rated for 500 megahertz. But there is a pretty open secret about this rating. When he has on his clippy little hat and his nice long ground tail, Paul doesn't actually offer 500 megahertz of bandwidth. Hey, don't take my hat. Don't take my tail. In order to push this little guy to his limits, he can only be wearing his tiny little ground lead. I feel naked. Nobody said test engineering would be easy, or stylish. There is another secret lurking inside passive probes. Parasitics. What? Do I need a pill for that? No, Paul. It's because of physics, and physics can't be fixed with pills. But parasitics can be minimized, so there is hope. Parasitics are the tiny Henrys and Farads hidden in probe designs and accessories. These little guys work tirelessly to steal bandwidth from the system. The more accessories that are added onto the end of a probe, the more parasitics creep into the system. Since Passive Paul has to use the one mega ohm scope input, some of the parasitics can never be removed. A quick look at a few data sheets show that this scope has 15 picofarads of parasitic capacitance, and the probe has about 9.5 picofarads of parasitic capacitance. That's the lowest level of parasitic capacitance that one can hope to achieve with these components. Darn, that's disheartening. Of course, there is a hero on the way. Wait. Oh, yeah, Paul? Before you go, could you tell the people to stop rolling over me with their lab chairs? Oh, Paul, that's so sweet. Of course people are going to keep rolling over you. That's never going to change. This guy, right? Come on. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Our hero is on the way. Single-ended Sally, the active probe. Hey guys, I'm Sally. She is high bandwidth, offers low parasitics, and she's single-ended. That's pretty bad. Active probes, as the name implies, do have active components, meaning they need power to work. Whereas passive Paul works off a simple voltage divider, Sally has a tiny amplifier near her probe tip. Since active probes use amplifiers in their design, they can generally offer a little more sensitivity than passive probes. People do say I'm a good listener. Yep, active probes can look at teeny tiny signals. Of course, 
This comes with a cost because life. Active probes like Sally are a little bit more delicate when it comes to dynamic range. Passive Paul could look at a 400 volt signal with no problem at all, but single-ended Sally might be damaged if she got hit with that much voltage. There are accessories you can add to Sally to facilitate a larger voltage range, but remember, more accessories mean more sneaky parasitics. Those Henrys and Farads really are the worst. Since we're talking about parasitics, active probes offer the lowest parasitics money can buy. And money can usually buy some pretty low parasitics. Hey, Sally, can you tell us about your parasitics? I sure can. My data sheet says I only carry 0.8 picofarads of parasitic capacitance. That's 10 times less than poor old passive Paul. Poor guy. Whoa, that's a tiny number. Paul's carrying around an elephant's worth of parasitics, and Sally has a mouse's worth. Oh, somebody just checked my math, and a mouse is 200,000 times smaller than an elephant, so maybe that's not a perfect analogy. Certainly sounded nice, though. Without all those extra Henrys and Farads, active probes can provide a lot of bandwidth. Passive Paul topped out at 500 megahertz, but single-ended Sally has three gigahertz of bandwidth. And she has counterparts that go much higher. So if you can tolerate the lower dynamic range. Who can't tolerate a little less dynamic range? I mean, going fast requires sacrifices, people. Single-ended Sally and her single-ended active probe friends can provide lots of bandwidth to get signals into an oscilloscope. What if there are two signals, though? I wonder if there's a way to look at a pair of signals together without having to use two probes. Um, am I in the right spot? What are you doing here, Carl? I told you, current probes are at the end. But they said I could get chips back here. Get out of here, Carl. Nobody wants to hear about current probes right now. Go back to the lobby and sit quietly until you're called. Oh, yo, man. You might be looking for me. They told me I was late. Ah, hi there, Differential Dave. We were just wondering if there was a way to look at a pair of signals at the same time without having to use two probes. Oh, yeah, man. That's sort of my specialty. Great. Now, why would there be a pair of signals in the first place? Great question, man. Sometimes signals are routed on a PCB as a pair. Called a differential pair, man. When signals are routed this way, they can be a little more impervious to noise running around loose on the board. The noise sort of just cancels out, which is super sweet. Of course, you need a differential probe so your scope can see the signal right. That's where I come in, man. Okay. I think I get it. Differential active probes are useful for looking at differentially paired signals. This seems like a perfect match. Yeah, man. And since my differential amplifier treats everything just like a signal, you don't have to worry so much about me dragging your system down to the scope ground. What are you talking about? Scope ground? Oh, yeah. When you power your scope from your wall socket, your scope's chassis's been grounded, man. And when you connect a ground lead from your scope to your system, you can cause all sorts of trouble if your system operates on a battery. Now I can help by just treating everything like a signal, man. My two inputs go through my amplifier before they make it back to the scope. It sort of decouples everything. That sounds like it could be pretty useful for lots of engineers. Yeah, man. There's differential signals everywhere. Your USB stick, your HDMI monitor, even the ethernet cable connected to your computer. All those connections are differential, man. Hmm, wow. Another cool thing about differential active probes like Dave here is they also have tiny parasitics and lots of bandwidth. Not a lot of Henrys and Farads are tolerated by old differential Dave. 0.4 picofarads to be precise. This particular active differential probe offers 4.5 gigahertz of bandwidth, and there are some of Dave's friends that offer 16 gigahertz of bandwidth or even more. Bye, Dave. Later, dude. Now, 
Let's get weird for a little bit. What? Not yet, then. Carl, are you sneaking back in here? Get out of here, Carl. Nobody cares about current probes. Oh. Oh. Some people do care about current probes? Well, I'm still going to make Carl wait. As I was saying before, let's get weird for a little bit. Say hello to ZVC. We are many. Hello, human. Oh, you are super creepy. Did you arrive on a spaceship? We are a culmination of many man years of research and arrived by the toil of engineers. <laughs> Still pretty creepy. The ZVC is clearly a kind of weird probe, but it, they, are super useful for looking at tiny currents and tiny voltages. We are quiet. We have more bits and can see tinier waveforms. Most probes simply pass a signal from the probe tip to the oscilloscope. The ZVC operates a little differently. Inside that box is a separate 18-bit digitizer that acts like a miniature standalone oscilloscope. Then the digitized data is sent to the main oscilloscope. A pretty obvious question is, why? We can watch circuits sleep. Okay, that sounds scary. Although looking at a sleeping circuit is pretty important, especially if that circuit is running off a battery. When circuits use batteries, it is very important to tightly control the current drawn. So a trick engineers use is to put the circuit to sleep when it's not working. That lets the batteries last longer. Of course, a sleep isn't quite the same as completely off. A circuit has to have a tiny trickle of current to make sure it can easily wake up again. And the ZVC does a great job of looking at that tiny trickle of current. And since the ZVC has quite a few inputs, it can look at different parts of one circuit or multiple circuits at the same time. We see much. Now, there is a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. The ZVC doesn't have much bandwidth at all. In fact, the ZVC only has one megahertz of bandwidth. We are slow, but detailed. Generally, bandwidth isn't a big deal when looking at a sleep current, though. It's much more important to measure the size of the trickle and not the speed of the trickle. I suppose you can zoom away now, ZVC. We will be back soon. Here's a probe you don't see every day. High Voltage Harry. Hey, I'm Harry. I look at high voltages. Harry is a student of the obvious. Bless him. Harry is a differential probe, similar to good old differential Dave, but Harry's a little different. He's a little bit bigger. Well, a lot bit bigger. Yeah, bruh. I've been moving that iron for days. Eight sets of 20 every day, like a total unit. Hmm, super impressive there, Harry. I suppose there is a clue to the reason for Harry's size right inside his name. High voltage, Harry. Like a course. Little Dave can measure like, what, five, 10 volts? <laughs> Get in the gym, bruh. I can handle 1,500 volts. That's like, more than a thousand times more volts, bruh. Wow, that, that is pretty impressive. And I have a big bruh that can handle 6,000 volts. Dave, man, with his puny chicken arms. Man, hit the weights, bruh. I suppose a high voltage probe is great for measuring kilovolts floating all over the place. It turns out this is a pretty common scenario when you're charging electric vehicles. Nobody wants to wait hours to charge their car, so chargers move as much current as possible, as fast as possible, using really high switching voltages. Seems like a great place for high voltage Harry to flex. But the big size combined with rather large accessories must come with a cost. What? Yep, bigger size means less bandwidth. Size is actually pretty important when it comes to high voltages to help prevent arcing. You know, arcing, as in lightning. Arcing is bad for business. It's also 
pretty detrimental to breathing. So size is important, but it limits bandwidth. All that size hides all sorts of little Henrys and fairies. Sneaky little parasitics. <laughs> hey, bro, I do have a special shampoo for that. Uh, good for you. Perry here has 200 megahertz of bandwidth. And if you remember, little differential Dave has 4.5 gigahertz of bandwidth. That's quite a trade-off, but engineering is full of them. Trade-offs, I mean, not Dave's. Although, they're are a lot of Daves running around, too. Thanks, Harry. Later, bruh. Gotta get back to racking and stacking. Hmm. I think that about does it for probes. Um, I'm here. Yep. Can't think of any more. Seriously. Standing on the page. Oh, fine, Carl. Tell us about current probes. I did find the chips, by the way. And there was salsa. Whatever, Carl. We really need to wrap this up. Okay, okay. I measure current. Is that it? Well, basically, I snap around a wire, and as current passes through the wire, the current induces a voltage inside me. I then pass the voltage back to the oscilloscope. Sometimes, folks wrap the wire around me a few times to improve sensitivity, and that's kind of cool. Since I'm so big, I do have a slight bandwidth limitation, but I look at some pretty big currents, and no circuit works without current. All right, Carl, you do have a point. No circuit works without current. Looks like you can check up to 30 amps with 100 megahertz of bandwidth. Not bad, Carl. And you have cousins that go up to 2,000 amps? That's a boatload of current by any measure. Guess I'm glad you stuck around. Thanks, Carl. No hard feelings? I guess not. But I don't think I'm going to invite you to my birthday party or anything. Fair enough. And that brings our story to a close. We learned about those sneaky bandwidth thieves, parasitics, the worst Henrys and Farids ever. We met our heroes, Passive Paul, Single-Ended Sally, Differential Dave, Weird ZVC guy, High Voltage Harry, and Carl the Current Probe. We learned that the most convenient connection isn't always the best connection. Keep your accessories short, and hopefully we have a slightly better understanding of probes and how they make the most important connections for oscilloscopes everywhere. Don't struggle to get your oscilloscope connected to your circuit, Reach out and get a little help from your local Rodan Schwartz oscilloscope wizard. The end.